Very good. Thank you. Down on these. Questions? Yes. All right. So, uh, Ronnie, and then um, go to Ted. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. This book. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if, uh, if, uh, if there's any connection between um, what you've done and um, Doug Hofstadter's models of uh, fluid analogies, because he gave me your story about penumbras and connections, etc. Is something that, just from the point of view of, uh, if you might call it, uh, artificial intelligence phenomenology, um, he was working on with his computer models. Well, I'm pleased to see that resonance. I haven't, I'm not familiar with that model. But it's one thing to say, you know, metaphor involves making connections and overlapping regions. Another thing to get nitty-gritty neural yeah. mechanisms. So I think it's perfectly complementary enterprise. You could interpret it as evidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Ted. Is this working? I think this is great stuff. And as we were talking about earlier, I think you now have a genetic explanation and a kind of neurophysiological explanation for how vague talk of things like cognitive fluidity could work, right? Um, and this, this connection with metaphor is great. And I just finished my chapter on metaphor when I first read your work, and then I had to go back and rewrite everything, which is really annoying. <laughs> but thank you, I guess. Um, and, but the one, I think there's still a disanalogy, and I'm wondering what you think about this. Um, you, know, you mentioned Juliet is the sun. We're not projecting everything, right? We're just selectively taking things like heat or brightness. We're not taking a helium huge fusion yeah. ball. Um, the other thing about metaphor is that it's, it's voluntary in the sense that I know, at some level, I know it's a metaphor. And not all metaphors are like time and space seems kind of almost like synesthesia, like it's hard not to think in those terms. But Juliet is, as, is the sun is optional. And, and that seems different from like a color graphene synesthete where they're really seeing five being point. red or whatever. So just n neurophysiologically, what do you think is going on? Because metaphor is getting bracketed in a special way where it's not interfering. It's not sensory. Yeah. Well, right. two answers to that. I think that, well, the first answer is one isn't saying that, this, that synesthesia is metaphor. I mean, this is obvious to you, but just to spell it out, one isn't saying synesthesia is metaphor, obviously not, because it's arbitrary links between numbers and colors. What one is saying is the gene that gives some people the propensity to make these artificial links between number and color is the same gene, when expressed more diffusely, confers this propensity to link seemingly abstract ideas. Now, your other question was about uh, volitional, being able to link, uh, see, the li see the links between Juliet and the sun. No, sorry, what was your question on that? Yes, you see both the literal and, yeah, on the other hand, uh, the, the things like spatial metaphors are almost spontaneous. I would argue that they all begin like Juliet and the Sun, and then they become automatic and get to the realm of, 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 of you know, becoming completely automatized like spatial metaphors. You know. But one of the points I was making about the numbers being anchored in space, uh, anchored in body, is of course an evolutionary argument. Um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, Pat Churchland. So one of the things that is often seen in psychotics is a propensity to see significance and meaning and pattern and so forth, where, you know, the rest of us just see a spot in the rug. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes those sorts of perceptions, it, it's a kind of a hyperbolic pattern recognition, yes. also leads to behavior that can turn out to be very counterproductive, or at least against one's own interest. So I'm wondering if maybe the, there, is, there is a story to be told about sort of excessive um, lack of pruning, or, yes. or you know, the, where, where the pruning back should occur at least to a higher degree than it does, and when it doesn't you have this tendency, you know, to see the face of Jesus on a pizza or what have you. Yeah. Well, if it's expressed very selectively by transcription factors in the fusiform or in the angular, you're going to get these specific quirky synesthesias, which don't do any harm, which is, in fact, some of them say it enriches their lives, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if it's expressed more diffusely, I said it might make you more prone to creativity. But if it's expressed too diffusely, you know, then, then you might get schizophrenic propensities. And by the way, they're very good at punning, too. Um, you know, more often than metaphor, they're very good at seeing links which are almost comical. So, and nobody knows why they're good at punning, whereas uh, creative people may not necessarily be good at punning, but they may be good at metaphor. Although Shakespeare is good at both, as you know. <laughs> okay. And on that note, it's, it, one of my students, actually David, 
is looking at the link between schizophrenia and, and synesthesia to see if there is a, a, a higher incidence of that. Uh, yeah, but these are good, good questions. Yeah. So and, and by the way, Tim Crow and others have suggested that schizophrenia itself, may be, there may be a hidden agenda to those genes, which explains the very high incidence of schizophrenia. And he, I'm not clear about what he says that hidden, hidden agenda okay. is. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. So it's curious that uh, serotonin should be linked because we know serotonin is also linked to social status. Uh, Prozac, for example, is a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And so is, is, do people who are on Prozac ever have uh, more synesthetic? Well, no, as I said, it's the opposite. It blocks it because the increase in pro, uh, serotonin, it blocks it. It yeah. blocks it. Well, but then, so the, the question is, is there, is there some deeper link then? I mean, in other words, yeah. is there a social... Do the people who have synesthesia have, have some, some social problems? Well, yes, artists and poets have tremendous social problems. <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> and impoverished. Um, can somebody run a mic up there? I mean, I, I, who's got one? Oh, Philip. So, Rama, did you look at uh, multilingual synesthetes to make uh, sure that in a different language the synesthesia is in the same way? That's one question. The second one is, is it possible to have a reverse pop-out effect? So, for example, when you make this task with fives and twos, if instead of the twos you were to use color for someone who sees, you know, uh, two in red and you just show red, well, they now report seeing twos. So is there a bijective relationship sometimes between color and uh, numbers? And then Sorry, are, you, are you asking about bilingual? Or are you talking about coloring the, actually coloring the number the wrong color? That's the second question, right. So... So, so one, one is... Have two you, questions. And the third question is, if you look at Let's number line... Let's just do two. Oh, but hang on. It's, it's, it's related. So if, if you look at the number line, there is a, a bias here because um, if you look for the, the difference between a small and large number, it will take you more time to say the large number. So the control would be to uh, talk about two numbers which are very close one from the other, which are actually very big, so 8,000 and then 8,006 yeah, yeah. and then 0 and 6 and you no, see we, the same we, thing. We did, we did do that with higher numbers and, and the, it, the, the finding still holds up. I should tell you this was published about six or seven years ago. You know, I think in Terry's chapter or one of the, in a book chapter. And since then it's been replicated by two groups using a wide range of numbers. So that finding is solid. Now going back to bilinguals, it, it's odd. Sometimes you can have, one of the things I didn't mention was you get phoneme color synesthesia too, not just graphene. And sometimes similar sounding word, uh, letters produce the same color. Sometimes letters which have similar appearance produce the same color in the different languages. So it's not a very simple, clear-cut picture, but there's a whole uh, interesting question there about bilinguals. OK, two more and two more only. So who's got the mics? John? Is there any regularity between the association between particular colors? Okay, and that's a very good question. In other words, do all people who are synesthetes see <clears throat> A as red and B as green and so on and so forth? The short answer is no, there is no uh, such link, but it's not random either. People are much more likely to see certain numbers of certain colors uh, higher than chance. And I think this reflects the disposition of the color map in V4, the wavelength, and the way in which form uh, primitives are represented in the, in, in, in the same region. So that increases the likelihood that certain numbers are certain colors, which is what we see. And also I want to mention, if you have one type of synesthesia, Dan, I'll get to you in a minute, one type of synesthesia, like number line, or color, uh, tone color synesthesia, you're also more likely to have a completely unrelated type of synesthesia, which, which suggests that my argument about gene and selective gene expression is correct. Because in some people it's expressed more in a patchy manner in wider range of regions, and other people it's selectively expressed in the fusiform gyrus. 